What is up, you beautiful nerds? I am Wildfire One. You're listening and watching to Nerds New Sexy Entertainment. With me today is I School Nine Six Zero, and we have a really special guest today. Um, you might, guys might know him from a few anime, a few video games. Um, go ahead, sir. Who are you? <laughs> you might know me from the Tumblr, the Twitter, oh. as my role as background tree number three in my high school production of Little Orphan Annie. <laughs> uh, what's up, everyone? My name is Sean Chiplock. I go by Sonic Mega, a username that I came up with when I was 12 and skirting the rules on IGN's forums so that I could post and get into flame wars under the age of consent. Um, and uh, I've been a professional voice actor since 2013. Yeah. And an IGN forum user until 2021 when they find this interview and ban my account for being <laughs> underage when I signed up. <laughs> How dare you, sir? How dare you? Um, so we're going we're gonna to do some questions. We got some questions from fans. But uh, first and foremost, uh, I guess I want to touch base on how I know you. Uh, you did a voice for us on a little website called Newgrounds years oh. ago. Wait, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. The game I feel Ranger. like we're about to have like a, a long lost brother bonding moment right now. Oh, the Game Ranger, Captain R. No way! No way! Hold on, the Game Ranger. Would I find it by looking up the Game Ranger on Newgrounds? Uh, yes. <laughs> R, <the laughs> he's, he's totally looking it up. I feel like I feel you, like I know which one this you, well, is. Well, uh, uh, there's a story to this. Uh, we were doing auditions, and you came in as uh, a certain character. I'm I'm gonna let you try and remember this. You came in as a certain character, and me and uh, the guy I was doing it with literally fell in love with your voice because you did, you did, you ad libbed the voice. You ad libbed, we didn't even give you a line to say. You just did it. And we're like, holy shit. Yes. Yes. And at that point, I knew you were going to go somewhere. Oh but my God. Oh. If you can't so find it. I, I found I found the specific one, and I see that it was released in 2005, but my submissions only go as far back as 2007. Yes! <laughs> so, hmm, was this like a future episode? Because I didn't start voice acting until 2007. Uh, well, I, I, I can't tell you the exacts on the time, but um. I, know, I know that... Uh, I can tell you the story on what happened. That's about yes, it. Because it's you so long ago. I got, I've got i gotten gray game. since then. So, uh, more or less, what happened... You played Ganon. Yes. Okay, so it was one of the future episodes. I see that there was Game yes. Rangers 2 and 3 in yeah. like 2000. I think it was yeah. 3 that you you played Ganon in. Okay. And uh, what happened was... <clears throat> we, 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 were doing our, we were doing our auditions. And all of a sudden, you come in with this, like... Damn you, Link, and your cursed ocarina. Always foiling my plans and somehow rescuing Princess Zelda at the last possible second. Ooh, you pissed me off so much. And you even took the God Skantala tokens, you bastard. You, you, does that sound familiar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I do. Just how you said it <laughs> was fucking gold. And we, we uh, even wrote that in because you ad-libbed that. We wrote it in oh. because it was so fucking good. Oh god! Now part of me like I don't I don't I'm not gonna waste interview time on it, but part of me wishes like I could go through and listen to like the entire episode and try and find it. But this was it's back. About, it's about ten minutes long. It's yeah, towards the was, end. This was back before it had like the little time bar that you could skip around. So unfortunately, I'm not gonna listen. It's to that it's towards no the end. It's to towards the end at the fight. That was my first introduction to Sean Chiplock, oh. Sonic Mega. And I, I fell in love with the with the voice then, and then I I kind of I kind of kept watching and uh, like seeing where you were doing. You you did other other things on Newgrounds, which and it, every time I heard your voice, I was like, man, this guy is fucking great. Um, Newgrounds Newgrounds was definitely, and I want you to keep going. I just wanted to chime in on that. Yes, please. Day. Newgrounds was definitely the the spawning ground for my career as a voice actor because, mm -hmm. as you might imagine, at the time that I discovered the world of voice acting, I was thick in the new grounds billboard system <laughs> oh yeah animation. I, like, I would spend every day trying to up my rank because at the time i thought if i got it high enough they'd make me a mod yep. oh boy <laughs> oh boy i was i was one of those kids trust me I'm, oh it's I'm okay we've back. i i've been there i've been there right. too so um you know back back 
when AIM, when AIM was a, a oh chat method god. that the mods oh still used. Oh god. Right? Anyway, um, so at the time that I got involved, before my, uh, the person that would become my mentor, Devin Mack, before he kind of found me and plucked me up into the voice acting club, um, basically Newgrounds is where all of my passion, all of my fire instantly went. I was haunting the BBS board every day. This was back before they had a dedicated audio board. Mm -hmm. And so I was just refreshing every five minutes. And I wish I was exaggerating to see if someone posted something with the keywords, looking for audio, looking for voices, <laughs> mm -hmm. doing an animation. Um, and that's just how I wanted to get involved. And that's why you can see a lot of my, my early uh, involvements were stuff in like the Tom Fault Ace Attorney. The very first Newgrounds flash I ever did was actually a stop motion rather than animation. Um, mm. But yeah, I, I have to thank Newgrounds for basically providing me with all these opportunities from all these independent creators to, to get involved. And I think it kind of helped also develop my mentality because what was Newgrounds in its heyday if not a, a melting pot of passionate people just all kind of skittering together until something amazing popped up out of it. Whether it was everything artist, for everyone. Right. Yes. Everything for everyone. So please continue. Oh no, it's okay. That's as far as I went. I, I liked what I like what you just did. That was so Newgrounds um, w was and still is a pretty beautiful place. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people spawned from there. A lot of good, great names. Uh, so it's 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 nice to see that you know the humble beginnings. Okay, well let's move on to when I when I actually found out you made it big. When I actually found out that you you kind of made a career out of yourself for yourself in voice acting. I was okay. playing, and I I even posted this on Twitter. You responded. You may or may not remember. But I, uh, I posted on Twitter, I said, holy shit, Sean Chiplock is playing DeLuke in Secret of Mana, one of my favorite games, which I'm going to tell you right now, I am slightly jealous, because that is one of my favorite <laughs> games of all times. Oh, is it is it DeLuke rather than Dialuk? Well, I, either way, I mean, you're the voice, okay. you tell me! Okay. No, no, uh, no, it just caught me off guard, because like, ah yes, DeLuke, Genshin Impact, wait, what? what <laughs> yes, yeah. I think it's Dialuk, and I just got it mixed up. It, it sounds that sounds like a 1990s JRPG type of character name. Yeah, I am. I am Dialuk. I am Robertio. Yes. Yeah, but I, I heard your voice in that, and then it didn't hit me until I watched the credits roll, and I'm like, holy mm. shit! Ho so I look you up on Twitter. I'm like, holy shit! And I wanted to throw you some credit on that. That was freaking amazing. You did I a good job. I was really proud of the work that I did as Dialuk. I, I, it's been far enough away by now that I don't remember the specifics of the character or my performance as him, but it did feel like I had managed to avoid doing the very exaggerated like anime speech where like every other word is bolded. Mm -hmm. it, it felt like I had managed to play a more grounded, not completely realistic, but more <laughs> grounded soldier child who's just trying to focus on, on his task. Um, but I was really proud of the performance that I did in the part, spoilers for people who still haven't played Secret of Mana, um, when he ends up like getting possessed and yes. he's, like fighting off the, the possession. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple of points where I had to speak in time with the other half of me. And I was really, really happy with how I portrayed the side of him that was struggling but still managing to hold on. And it's part of what bums me out that the game's remake was not really well received. Um, and I don't hold that against anybody, you know, like, it, it's not up to me, you know, it's up to the development team, it's up to the fans, you know, how they want to interpret it. And then, you know, stuff like Secret of Mana had already been released or available in different formats for years versus something like Trials of Mana, which had come over to the States, I believe, for the first time in any official capacity, and was coming over as a remake with voice acting. So, yes. just differences in, in opportunity, but... You know, I appreciate that I was able to entertain at least one person through that performance. Because I, I take pride in all of my roles for at least some different reason. Um, and to know that it, it was able to impact someone is, is really important. Well, well received or not, I think you did an amazing job. There there were, you know, not being overcritical, but there were some uh, uh, other voice acting talent in there. Mainly all the, and then it, it, mainly all the, uh, the mushroom people. 
It was mm-hmm. a little overdone, a little goofy, but you know, it was meant to be that way. I get it. it right. Was, they were meant right. to be silly because there's parts of that game that are Santa Clauses in the fucking game. So right. you know. we're talking about we're talking about bringing to life a a game that was produced in the '80s and '90s. Um, when the aesthetic of a lot of games of that era were a lot different. I mean, look at something like Tales of Arise versus Tales of Symphonia. It's a perfect example of how the visual nature, the the atmosphere of a game can change significantly across oh, the yeah. decades. Oh, so, yeah. you know, you still have to stay true to the aesthetic of that game, but that doesn't mean that it's automatically going to line up with what gamers in, you know, the late 2000s are expecting to yeah. see from a game in that day and age. I, again, I saw that game, and I, I saw your name in it, and I just, that kind of like, I was like, ooh, <laughs> it was all happy, and I thought it was great. Um, Ice Cold, is there anything you want to chime in on? Nope. Not, not yet, at least. Not <laughs> yet, at least. I'm, okay. I'm, the, I'm the interview golden retriever. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly just a bit starstruck, because you voiced one of my favorite uh, characters in anime uh, from uh, ReZero. Oh Super. yeah, you're not scared. like that. That was, that was one of my favorite <laughs> anime characters. I'm I'm just sitting here like, oh my gosh, it's actually him. When dude, go ahead, go ahead. When I uh, when I because in the, our Discord channel, I I we have a crew chat. I had posted that I I contacted you and you contacted me back right away. Which by the way, like I, I <laughs> I'm I'm still flab. I like my mind's still blown about that. Thanks thanks for being so so. So uh, quick to come back to me, uh, but I told him that yeah, you know what? We got Sean Chiplock for a uh, for an interview, and the first person that freaked out <laughs> was me. Was Ice was Cold? He's guy. like, oh my god, you know, you got the voice of this guy, and, I, and I'm like, yeah, well, you know, uh, I'm like, do you want to be a part of that? I think his answer was hell yes. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but what were just you gonna like, say, just Sean? Like activate the lights. I I don't remember at this oh. point. Um, is, is that why you got the lights in the background making like a, a pseudo S? Um, like it, it, it writes S. <laughs> I didn't even think of it. Oh, well, I, I honestly, honestly, I didn't bring it up. Uh, maybe, but um, no. This like, is really binary. It says in binary, please sign my next of kin. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Um, what you drinking there, bud? What you drinking there? Oh, the, the Pepsi. Pe- Pepsi. Diet Pepsi. I mean, I mean, I got something a little bit bigger than his uh, Pepsi can here. Oh, let me. Okay. Um. Yeah. All I'm... right. Well, I got I got something a little bit bigger than his Pepsi can. Oh. <laughs> what do you guys? That water? <sighs> it's a Yeti dick. No. It's a <laughs> it's Yeti <a> dick. <laughs> no. Um. So it's it's a 64 ounce growler. It's called. It's one of those double insulated like water containers. Yeah. So like if you put. If you put hot water in here, it stays hot. If you put, I have put water in here. I put ice in here and filled it up with water, and then just kept it closed. And Ooh. I've had there still be ice in this thing up to three days after. Oh I wow! It in wow! Still freezing. It was so weird. It caught me off guard at one point. Like, did that? You know that thing where if like you drink a drink that's a little colder than you expect, it kind of yeah. stings your teeth because you weren't ready for it. Yeah. That that would catch me off guard because it'd be like. 90 degrees out here and I would pick this up and go to hydrate and like Antarctic cold would hit the back of my mouth it was impressive Arctic ice it, it, yeah it's almost, it's almost this, this, this interview was sponsored by raid drinking legends make sure to buy your 64 ounce garlic it's almost like you got a uh, brain freeze from drinking in, in the middle of a heat wave yeah yeah <laughs> so uh, I don't I don't drink much soda anymore but Red Bull I still have I limit myself to one per day because mm-hmm. I watched a, I saw a co-worker well I didn't see a, it happen to a co-worker of mine but a coworker of mine died of a heart attack drinking Ooh. three or four a night at a night. Yeah, oh, uh, she, yeah, no. Yeah. I'll tell you. I'll tell you from experience. Go ahead. One energy drink, and done. Because you do. You, I I had a I had a heart attack at like thirty four. Oh shit. Because I was doing like double double shifts at work and right. and like I drank, I was drinking them hand over fist. And I was right. after that I was like I you know when I ended up going to the hospital and the, the doc's like, yeah you had a mild heart attack. I'm like what. I'm 34, I, dude. I could probably handle more than one if I spaced it out, like one in the morning, yeah. one in the evening. But like, I just mentally uh, that that thought never left my mind. So it was like, one, you can choose. You can have it in the morning if you want. You can have it late at night if you want to stay up. But once you drink that one, until you sleep yep. and wake <laughs> back up, you don't get another one. Yep, that's a smart I, way I, of doing it. 
I've held fast to that. It's served me very yeah, well. Yeah, b- b- live live by that moral because like yeah. I learned the hard way. And you I, can live by that moral or die not following it. Exactly. Yeah, pretty exactly. much. Exactly. <laughs> of course, I've been kind of keeping up with you on Twitter. I realize you have a squirrel friend. I have several. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. You're the squirrel whisperer now. Well, I haven't seen them very often as of late, and it's for various reasons. One might be because I know that there's at least two stray cats in the area, and they may like Aww. not want to run around if the cats... Because there was one morning, like last week, where it started to come over to be fed by me, and then I saw the stray cat sneak up from behind and start chasing it. Aww. So they're probably wary of that. You're but, probably like, um, run, my squirrel friends, run! Right, right, right. Well, I just kind of stood there like, is nature about to run its course, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, but and there's also a neighbor of mine across the street that has like fig and fruit trees and the squirrels probably like the sugary fruits more than they like the walnuts. So, yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's limited. Um but yeah, it started with I've I've always been really I can't say attracted. I need to think of the proper word. Um amused, entertained yeah. by animals. Um, and so I, I like I always enjoy the idea of possibly making friends with them. Like if I could have the crow friend that like brings me shiny objects, that would be freaking cool. <laughs> And I don't remember how it started. I just know that I was able to, to give some nuts to one of the squirrel friends. And then when I knew that it had gone beyond what I thought it was, was so there's this cat that I basically take care of. We, we can't have pets in the apartment, but there's this cat that was abandoned by its owners about two and a half, three years ago and came around to our neighborhood. And I didn't know it was stray at the time. I just started taking care of it. And now he visits every single day. So he's basically... <laughs> Like, like, I have medical responsibility for the cat now. They, they signed over that responsibility to me. Um, and at one point, uh, I, I, was, I was chilling on the couch in the middle of the day, and I, if I could, I'd turn my laptop to show... I, I'll see if I can do it now, like, very briefly. Come on, come on, keep turning. Okay, that doorway. Okay. And, and I started hearing what sounded like uh, when the cat would come by and I'd have the great door closed, the outer door closed, the cat would, like, press his weight up against it. Um, and it would, it would create like that metal rattling sound and that's how I knew he was there. So I heard it and I was like, what is he doing here this early? He normally only comes late in the afternoon, but it sounded a lot more frantic than usual. Oh. Like something was climbing up it. So I look over and the squirrel had somehow tracked my scent to my apartment. I, I had never let it back here. I had never like, like led a trail and like had it come to my front door in order to be fed. I always went out to the side of the sidewalk and fed it. So this mother somehow followed my scent to my apartment door and wanted to come inside. He was still super skittish, but next, there's probably still photos on my Twitter if you scroll back far enough, which I wouldn't dedicate the time. It's what Twitter's search function is garbage. Yes. Um, there are photos and video of me just laying on the couch, reaching my hand behind my head. I've seen that. Feeding this squirrel that's just chilling on the side. It was ridiculous. I actually that that's I think where I first got where you were the squirrel whisperer when I saw it. That's probably the first video I saw because right. he, he came in in your house and he was up on your, your couch and I was yep. like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Also, I got another question for you. Okay. What the hell is a, a hundred hour poo? Oh, no, it's the one hour poo. The one hour uh, poo. Thank you. Well, what the I, hell is a one hour poo? <laughs> I finally got to be blessed. We So there's this Walgreens that's near where I live that I often go to to charge my hybrid car to grab the Red Bull restocks. Um, I just keep thinking that's Red Bull. It's like, oh, I want it's, it. okay. Anyway, it's okay. No, it's okay. Um, and uh, we, ca- we came there late in the evening. So what happened was um, my car's in the repair shop right now. It was uh, the victim of a hit and run in California. Ooh, it doesn't I remember have reading any that. Laws. It doesn't have any laws protecting against hit and runs. So really? Was, yeah, yeah. So uh, outside of my deductible, I was fully on the hook for the repairs, which um, turned out to be in my benefit because uh, the initial repair estimate was about fourteen hundred. I was like, "This is stupid. I'm paying a thousand dollars out of fourteen hundred. But then when they actually brought it in, they realized it had cracked the headlight and a couple other things. So the actual repair cost was thirty three hundred. Oh, but I only geez. I only had to pay the thousand dollar deductible. So now now it was worth it. And the insurance company came back and said, "Hey, we determined you were not at fault. So, you know, ultimately doesn't matter to me. My my insurance rate doesn't go up. It, whatever, life happens. Yeah. Um, better better for it to happen while I'm not in the car than while I'm in it. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, so my my car's been in the repair shop, and one of my my best friends has been very generous in basically carting me around to sessions and appointments that require me to drive somewhere. Um, I've been paying him for the time, and we started heading back 
rather late from one session because it was a seven o'clock uh, in the evening session. Um, and as we go back, I say, hey, can you stop at Walgreens? I need to pick up some Red Bull because I ran out at home. And uh, we park in the parking lot and I'm like, oh man, there's signs falling apart again. You know, I've seen I've seen the Walgreens sign in all different sorts. I've seen it as Walgren, I've seen it as Lagreen, I've seen it as, like, you saw the one in the video was like Lol, Lolgen or something like that. It was like Forest Wag Wagin or so Walgren probably, or probably my favorite one was the Walgreens Harmacy. Like come here <laughs> for pain. Um, but then I happen to look over and I see that the one hour photo is missing the H and the T and has become the one hour poo. Mm -hmm. And and I know it wasn't the first time it's ever happened. Like I distinctly remember when other people had posted about that online with their own Walgreens. But it was like, I'm here in front of a legend. I'm here at the one hour poo. Let's go, baby. <laughs> that's uh, it. Sounds like a bad Taco Bell skit. Honestly, that's about how long I take every time. It's when I. It's the only time I get any personal time to myself. Switch. <laughs> Hello. Hello. You think I'm gonna stop gaming just because I have to take a dump? This is what this was made for, buddy. Okay, but real talk, real talk, uh, uh, Wildfire. Mm -hmm. First two years that I owned a Switch, I never played it as a portable console. It was just, I still had a 3DS. And so my brain kind of separated as, this is the home console, mm -hmm. the 3DS is the portable console. So there was one time where there wasn't, there wasn't really anything I was playing on 3DS at the time. Um, but I did have Chocobo Mystery Dungeon Everybody on the Switch, and so I decided to bring the Switch with me um, in order to, uh, to to keep myself entertained. So I'm sitting there at the airport, I've gone through the gate, and I'm like, okay, it's about an hour before they start boarding for my flight, I guess I'll play the, the Switch as a, as, as a handheld. Yeah. Here we go. And you know, like, I take it out, I plug it in, and I'm like, first of all, it was the fact that I brought the charger with me, so I was like, oh, you can bring the charger and plug it into the Switch. It I forget to that, like, too. I forget right? that well, so much. Well, I mean, it's also, it's been a relatively new thing that airport terminals have chargers and airplanes mm -hmm. have, airplanes have uh, DC outlet chargers. Like, that's <laughs> the craziest thing. USB outlet, fine, I expect that. But to have a whole ass AC outlet on the side of your seat, what? Yeah, that that could be sadly uh, misused. Oh, what for? Yeah, I'm curious. A uh, metal fork. Oh. <laughs> you gotta be extremely <laughs> stupid baby, to do if, something if like that. If the baby doesn't stop crying, I'm gonna put the fork <laughs> in the hand and put it in there myself. So, here, Munchkin, anyway. put this in your mouth. <laughs> Oh, look at that. Look at that hairstyle. Anyway, so so I'm sitting there, and, and the game boots up, and I'm watching the opening cutscene of the game, and it looks just as fine on the console as it does on the TV, and that's when I'm, I'm literally sitting here going, oh my god. Like, <laughs> that was what I said to myself. Just, oh my god. And, I'm, and, and it, it changed. Like, I cannot believe that there was a point in my life that I would sit on planes for three, four, five hours and not have something like the Nintendo Switch or the 3DS in front of me to do. And and not have to worry about the battery running out, mind mm -hmm. you. Because I remember when there was a point where there weren't chargers on planes, nope. so the 3DS I could play for about three, four hours, but if it was like a five, six hour flight going from Michigan to California for the Expo, I, I had to have something for those last two hours. Mm -hmm. But now, now, Oh my god, I make so much progress in my RPGs, it's stupid. <laughs> and that's the beautiful part about that. It, it, You know, technology. So, before we continue, I know I know that this interview is going on all different, different sorts of Oh, games. no, no, this, this is that's part of the course fine. for us. It's okay. So, so you, um, it looks like you have the green screen thing active where if you go too far back, you just like disappear off of the camera, right? Or is it an auto- No, this is actually a uh, thing for uh, Discord. I just found it today. Yeah, oh, he, cool. he says that, but I like I haven't found the option at all. It have just, you? Have you? Go ahead. It may. Well, it just makes my background. This is my real background. It just makes oh, it uh, okay. blurry. But okay. I do have a green screen, like three. Have you, have you seen the video of like the brother that like 
uh, the girl has a green screen up where if you're too far back, you just disappear. Like, you're not part of anything. Yeah. And the brother, like, does a bunch of Naruto hand signs before jumping back and disappearing out of the screen. <laughs> I haven't <laughs> seen that. Oh, it's so... I, I hope you come across it in the vast wilderness of the internet. It's so funny. <laughs> it was just one of those random GIF images that came across. I'll probably find it, like, somewhere or another. It, it, I end up finding a lot of crazy things, at least on Facebook or, or on Twitter. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I kind of feel similar when it comes to, you know, using the Switch. Although, when I say Switch, I have the light version as opposed to you guys having Ooh. the full. Because I couldn't afford the extra $100 <laughs> to get the full it version. It makes sense. But, um, so, like, I haven't, I haven't been tied down to using a TV for it. But, like, lately there's been a rare amount of times where I would play it, except if I was on, you know, in a bathroom or something, <laughs> or on very long road trips. Right. Yes. And that's, what's, that's what they're really good for. I, even though I, I kind of have the mentality Sean does, I don't like to move it from this little home. <laughs> it likes to, I like to keep it in its little home and, and play it on the television. It's just recently kind of the same thing. I've been like, oh, you can travel. You can, mm -hmm. you can go with me places. We can go on little adventures while going on adventures. You know, and it's, uh, it was, it, it, yeah, and I completely forget that you can bring the, the charger with it. That's mm, the big thing. That's right. That, that is definitely the big thing. Did you want to start asking a few questions, uh, Ice Cold? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, you were talking about, uh, the Switch and you, before you made a joke about, uh, consoles. I was wondering, like, what is your favorite way to play a game? Would it be either, like, on console, PC, or, heaven forbid, mobile? Because there you are know, pe mobile gamers out there. I haven't really <laughs> given PC gaming a lot of credit. Like, I, I don't know. Like, generally, if a game is available on Steam and on Switch, I would rather get it for Switch. And I don't really have a good reason for that. Well, okay, maybe I do have a decent reason. Like, I, I like the controller for mm -hmm. the console more than I do because I have like a Steam controller but it just doesn't feel the same way that like the Joy-Cons do or the PlayStation controller does um, and I'm, I'm trying to avoid like the being hunched over in front of a keyboard which is super bad for my back mm -hmm. um, but most of the time I would say the two main ways that I game are Switch and mobile like on mobile right now you probably see me glancing down every so often it's because uh, World Flipper this this uh, <laughs> This pin, no, no. Are you familiar with World Yes. Or... Okay. Uh, I'm um, not, but I want to hear this. Well, I want to ask first, Are you? do you play it? Like, are, do you have a profile um, on it? Uh, I, I don't, but I'm familiar with it. Okay. To give you an idea, it's been out for about 11 days now, so keep that mm -hmm. in mind. All right? About a week and a half. Okay. Most of my, most of the people following me, let's see, we've got rank 39, rank 39, 58, 55, 62... I've, I've followed mostly higher rank people just because they tend to do a lot of grinding 49. So somewhere between like 30 and 55 is a standard I imagine normal people would be at by now. Me, I just hit 86. Oh my god! And at this point, at this point, the <laughs> hardest available, currently available boss, when you beat it, the EXP bar goes like, beep. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it, it makes no movement whatsoever. But, you know, uh, the mobile games are really fun for me because a lot of them have come up with really good action mechanics. Like, uh, World Flipper is literally a pinball gotcha. It, you are controlling characters as if they were pinballs in, like, a little machine table board with, with bosses and raids and stuff like that. And then Dragalia Lost, which is about to uh, uh, celebrate its third year anniversary, that's another really big one where it's like there's a, there's a good skill ceiling. There's a good amount mm -hmm. of skill that you need in order to do some of the endgame content. You can't just tap your phone and be done you have to know how to dodge attacks you have to coordinate with your teams it's fun i really enjoy the challenge um but the switch right now has basically all of the games that i'm interested in playing i think the, the last time i touched the playstation was for um for trails of cold steel for trails of cold steel one two three and four which by the way i will be doing a non-stop speed run marathon of in exactly one week like, <laughs> literally Literally, in a week minus an hour from now, I am going to do a marathon stream where I cannot stop streaming until I beat all four Cold Steel games, oh, one after the other. Red Bull! With the <laughs> uh, no, Red Bull will be involved at some point. <laughs> um, 
But, um, yeah, but outside of that, like, Switch has, like, all of the games that I'm super interested in. I played Hades on Steam until it was available on Switch. We've got Fuga Melodies of Steel. We've got Shadowverse Champions Battle. Undernauts is coming out pro relatively soon for it. If you have any idea how crazy I am about first-person dungeon crawlers, uh, <laughs> Demon Gaze Extra is coming to the West. Like, the uh, Demon Gaze was what got me into dun dungeon crawlers in the first place. Just all of these amazing games coming to Switch, and so... I'm, I'm not meaning to shit on other consoles, but, like, there's already so much on my backlog specifically for Switch mm -hmm. that I really just have not had the time or the inclination to touch other stuff. So there's your answer, Ice Cold. He loves okay. the Switch. Which is... All right, then. Which is... A, it's a good console. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the Switch as well. That's why I got one. Um, right. So that, it makes sense. Uh, I mean, I, I used, I had phases. I was a Nintendo fanboy for a while. I got super addicted to the Vita for a while. Like, there were so many games that I was in franchises that I was introduced to through the Vita, especially once they started doing, like, cross-store downloads between PS3 mm -hmm. and Vita. Um, but now it's not so much being a Nintendo fanboy, I promise. It has no relation to the fact that I voice in a lot of games <laughs> that are on Nintendo Switch. It's just that a lot of, a lot of the games that are worth their salt end mm -hmm. up on the Switch at some point. Yeah. So I'm, I can already play those games without having to divide my time between consoles, and I'm not super big on, like, visual quality difference. Like, as long as it's not chugging at, like, 20 frames per second, I don't really care. So if well, I can get all of those gaming experiences on Switch, then I'm going to stick with Switch. Well, the Switch is also good for when you're on the go. You know, obviously. Mm -hmm. So, and, you know, I'm assuming you're on the go quite a bit. I, I remember I got, I don't even want to say I got political, but I remember at one point I said, like, here's why Nintendo doesn't care about the fact that the Switch isn't as powerful as the PS5 or the Xbox. They realized what the Switch offered that nothing else in the market to that degree offers. You know, if you go home, you can have a choice between the Switch or the PS5. People are probably going to go with the PS5. Some people will still play the Switch because they're a family. You know, they enjoy the games on the mm -hmm. Switch. When the moment you leave the house, what options do you have? Either mobile games, which Nintendo is is trying to veer more into, or if you the Switch. <laughs> and I said it is no surprise that they went all in on the mobile capacity, on the battery life, on basically replacing the 3DS with a console that can do both. Yep. Because there is no competition for that side of the market. They've got such a strong. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was about to say you, there's no. You said there's no competition when there actually is starting to be competition. Uh, Valve is making something called the right. Steam Deck. Oh yeah, right, right. right which right. which is a uh, comparing it to a high end PC. It's at least worth you know twelve thirteen hundred dollars. Right. For the specs it has. Well, we keep in mind, and I completely agree with you. So mm -hmm. I can adjust my point to say up until this point. Yeah, there up was until no this competition. Point. And, and so, you know, Steam Deck very well may take some of Nintendo's profits mm -hmm. away. Like, at given enough time, there will be competitors in the market. Oh, yeah. yeah. But just think of how long the Switch has been around by yeah, now. Yeah, exactly. Uncontested like... for its market share. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, I Nintendo, agree. They, Nintendo they... hit something when they did that. And, I mean, Nintendo's always, in my opinion, has always been kind of the, the mobile gaming, like, you know, portable gaming guru. You know, mm -hmm. uh, for a while, Sony tried it, and it really didn't take off. You know, for a while, of the play, right. the play, well, that's because that's because Sony wanted proprietary everything. You had to pay yeah. like you had to pay separately for the memory card, which only went up to so much. You had to pay separate for you know all the charging stuff. Nintendo, yeah. I'm literally planning to wait until Black Friday or Cyber Monday later this year, and I'm either going to upgrade to a 512 or a one terabyte SD card. Yes, and <laughs> all I have. All I have to do to put it in my Switch is format it. I've already got the thing that will let you plug in two different SD cards, transfer the data, and and I'm good. Yeah, That is beautiful. Across your fast experience of being a voice actor, what has been your favorite character voice actor? First of all, <laughs> at first I heard it as, as cross as across your whole fascist career. I was like, whoa! Oh, wait, whoa, what? no! Whoa. Whoa. Your whole, what are you your doing? Whole what are you doing here? Experience. <laughs> <laughs> your voice acting career. Whoa! <laughs> okay. It's not that kind of show, that I went swear. downhill quickly! Oh, how dare you imply Rivali is not a communist. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Sorry. So, um, this is going to sound like a cop-out answer until you hear any other interview where I've been asked this and then you realize it's consistency. Mm -hmm. um, I am someone who is both very passionate about this career and also realistically battles with a lot of I'm not going to say dark thoughts, but but has to constantly be aware of those creeping thoughts of envy and jealousy. Mm -hmm. And it's just something that comes with the passion. If you're passionate, you're going to be very passionate about the things you do have, and you're going to be passionate about the things that you don't have or that you missed out on. Um, and I'm, I'm not the most social person. I know that may come as a surprise to you, but I'm not the most social person when it comes to keeping abreast of what all of my colleagues are up to. So I don't really have a good idea of how much I'm working versus, you know, my colleagues that I'm, I'm working alongside. Mm -hmm. But I have an inkling that I'm doing pretty fucking well for myself. Oh, oh yeah. Sorry yeah. if, pardon my French. I don't, I meant to ask if this was a PG. You can curse oh, all you want. Fine. So part of how I keep myself humble is I, I remind myself for every role that you get, that is an opportunity that someone else might have had that they didn't get, you know? Mm -hmm. I think about I think about ReZero and how many seasons that might go on for. You know, the fact that I did a callback for that. I think about uh, uh, Cheeky Granbell in Eden Zero, which could be as big as Fairy Tale for all I know. Yeah. And now I'm signed on for that. That is that could have been a career maker for somebody else that I'm now in charge of. Mm -hmm. So as part of keeping myself humble and as part of not losing sight of, of what it means to care about this career. And, and to hold on to that same kind of passion that helps lead to good performances. I do my best, it's, it's usually not hard, but I do my best to find something about every single role that I play that makes it special to me, you know? Okay. Um, and, and the three that I usually fall back on are, is it a, a brand new experience for me that I've, I've accomplished for the first time? Is it a challenge that I overcame um, uh, uh, yeah, is it a new milestone? Is it a challenge that I overcame? Or is it something that I knew I was going to be good at and I knocked it out of the park? Like, that was just, it was just pure Sean doing his thing because he knows exactly what he's going to do with this character. And ironically, um, there's an example of each of those in Breath of the Wild. Um, <laughs> Te Teba was the example of a role that I knew exactly what I was doing and I knocked it out of the park. Teba actually was a case where I told... <laughs> I told the big wigs at Nintendo listening in, I know what I want to do for this character. And then I did it, and they went, all right. <laughs> like, okay. like, Good job! Like, like, if that's not an ego stroke, I don't know what is at that point. Um, uh, the Great Deku Tree was, a, I believe, a milestone for me, because that was an example of, okay, well, you don't, you don't sound like what the Deku Tree sounds like. What can you do? with your vocal talent to create a voice that sounds believable for the Great Deku Tree. Mm -hmm. And that was, okay, well, I can't I can't get super low and gravelly like, you know, baritone people yeah. can. But maybe I can do something very deep and very slow and very wise. You know, something yeah. you know, that, that very, like, like a big tree would have all of this room for this air to come up. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a challenge that I overcame. Or, or the the milestone, and then Rivali was the asshole that made me overcome a challenge because, um, uh, without getting into too much detail, I I had a different interpretation of his cockiness than what his character development actually revealed to me, and so I came in with an idea, but we had to scrap it and start over, and that was really really stressful. Um, mm -hmm. So much so that I actually broke down crying to my mentor over the phone when we, I was discussing like how I was scared that I wasn't going to capture what they wanted for the character, that they were going to recast me, and I liked his design so much. And it taught me that I had to I had to be willing to get outside of my own head. And if I didn't know what I was doing, I had to be willing to trust in the director and the sound engineer, basically to just make myself a vessel for them to direct through mm -hmm. until I felt like I understood enough that I could take back control and flow from there. And at some at certain points of Breath of the Wild, that's what I ended up doing. I ended up just just listening and parroting what they did until it sounded good. With even if I didn't trust or understand why it sounded good in my own head, mm -hmm. um, and then by the time I came back for Age of Calamity, 
I was in full control. Like I understood <laughs> the character. I understood what they were looking for. I, I knew the story well enough that I wasn't guessing what was going on. And they didn't have to direct. I mean, they directed, but they didn't have to lead the reins around mm -hmm. at all. It was just me doing my thing. And they were like, oh, I can't pick which one I like more, you know? So. <laughs> So it's okay. uh, yeah, it sounds like it sounds like you 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 got you had to find your stride with that character, right? And once and you so did, you were. That's what I do with all of my characters, you know. With with Shiki in Eden Zero, I told myself this is not just a repeat of Subaru. Do not just play this as another main character, young male, black-haired protagonist. Yes. Find out what makes Shiki different, mm -hmm. and I did. I found out Shiki is a little younger. He's he's higher pitched in the register. Unlike Subaru, he does a lot more acting than he does thinking. Um, <laughs> and I've described him to people as, if, if Subaru is someone who, you know, measures 200 times and cuts once, Shiki is someone who always feels like they are one smirk away from breaking out into laughter. Um, <laughs> or breaking out into a stupid big grin. And those are all little nuances to help determine what kind of voice I do for the character or why they are important to me. And okay. I just repeat that process every time, and that's that's how I, that's how I learn to cherish every opportunity that I'm given, whether it's a minor character or a main protagonist. Okay. Okay. Very in depth answer. Answer. I like that. That was very well done. Um, I mean, look at you, for example. You you thought or heard of me because of dialogue, and you really really enjoyed that performance. In the grand scheme of Secret of Mana, who cares about dialogue versus someone like Popoe or something like that? Yeah. You know? <laughs> um. But to you, it mattered. And because it matters to you, it matters to me. And that's beautiful. That's freaking that beautiful. Is. That is. If you can voice act, Sean, in any show, as any character, what would you choose? In any show or yeah. any medium whatsoever? Yeah, any, well, any medium. We'll do video games, everything. Anime, whatever. If you can voice act in anything, if you have I, your choice. Okay, so the basic one is I've come super, super close to voicing Pokemon before. Like, I have... I was in Detective Pikachu, although it was as two human off-screen, like, I was, I was like an arena announcer and, like, the trained PSA system or something mm -hmm. like that. But I did get to read for Charmander, Flareon, and Psyduck, I think. Oh, wow. Um, so I didn't end up getting past it. Yeah. Sai. You know, something like that. Oh my god. Uh back back when Pixelmon was a really big thing in Minecraft, I did like a hundred and fifteen different, you know, I had like Squirtle, Squirtle, ah, rah, you know, stuff like that. I was mm -hmm. I was coming up with those voices. Um I don't do it anymore for particular legal reasons, but yeah. um so I would still really you know, I as 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 early back I remember a couple of years ago I got to audition for Bidoof and I thought it would be the funniest goddamn thing <laughs> if me, the shit poster, got to voice Bidoof. <laughs> um, so I haven't had the chance yet, I haven't had the opportunity, but I would love if I could manage to get involved. Like Pokemon Journeys, um or or Generations, I think it was called. The the six episode quick series that kind of went through the Kanto yeah. story really, really mm -hmm. briefly. Um I would love if I could be a part of something like that. For video games, everyone that has ever asked me that question or knows me online knows my answer to that at that point. Um, I want to be a male voice option for a game like Etrian Odyssey. For a oh, first yes. person dungeon crawler. Okay. Not, I don't even need to be a story mode character. And the reason is, um, if you're familiar with first person dungeon crawlers, they're often about, if they don't have an established story mode, about creating your own party. You are in charge of coming up with their backstories. And especially in games like Etrian Odyssey, and it's become way more common in stuff like Demon Gaze, in Undernauts, in Stranger of Sword City, um, you can select the voice type that you have. There's usually like 30 male, 30 female options. Or in, in the case of Etrian Odyssey, they're, they're organized by uh, personality, like calm, aggressive, hype man, stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, the idea that I could just be somewhere in that list and have the option of you embodying the character with my personality is really exciting to me, especially if it means I get to go on those labyrinth adventures with you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's the one that's that's really 70s. I would I would love to be a part of a franchise like Etrian Odyssey going forward. That's and go ahead. that's interesting. That's I, like I wasn't expecting that answer. I was expecting you to say something. I don't know. I don't even know what you. But I wasn't expect. I like that. I like that because you never know where the passion's gonna come up. You know, right? Like I, I would love to play something like I don't know, Boulder's Gate Four, and then choose you as a fucking like a, yeah. as a voice. You know, right? 
Yeah. Listen, listen, because like, like, like to me, it's like if you can play a, a, a cutscene character who only speaks in major story cutscenes. But if I get to voice the mage guy who's like fireball, you know, something like that, mm -hmm. you're gonna use that like 200 times over the course yeah. of the stage. You're gonna get to listen to me. So it's it's. I, I didn't mean to say that so selfishly, but no, I'm it's hilarious. Like, it's great. It's you know, great. It, uh, another big example was Maple Story Two when I voiced mm -hmm. the Berserker class. Um, it was so cool that I was fighting these bosses, and every time my character used one of their skills, I was listening to me say the skill name as he like you know um, when there was one where he literally just says fall, and it's like really intense, and it's got like that weight, like he's slamming his sword down. Mm -hmm. And so, as as I would watch my character, you know, lift their great sword up and slam it into the head of the boss, and I hear me saying "fall" like very aggressively. It's so cool. Now, now to that extent, like when your character would do so like that, do you say it in person as you're no. saying it in game? No, <laughs> no, it would wear my throat out so quickly. I'm gonna make sure I do it as perfectly as possible when I'm in the booth getting paid for it. But the reason why I do it so perfectly is so that people don't feel the need to say it to themselves because they're like, no, I like how it sounds. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, yeah, that, that was perfect that way, yeah. How or, you know, when did you know that you wanted to be a voice actor? I don't know if I could give, like... You know what? No, there is an answer to that question, but it's not the answer that people expect. Mm -hmm. um, to... to help you understand, I'm going to start by not answering that question. I'm going to answer the auxiliary question, which is what got you into voice acting. Mm -hmm. um, at the time that I discovered voiceover, there wasn't really anything in my high school curriculum that interested me. Mm -hmm. um, I was a huge fan of math until pre-calculus happened, and then we <laughs> broke up and never looked back. Um, science was really fun for me. Chemistry was really fun until they introduced the action line which oh, introduced no. math, and then I went, you fucker, I told you not to come back here! So... We broke uh, up! Stop calling me! I burst, stop calling me! History, I... History was okay, I, I I think it was a little bit more selfish, like, I personally was not interested in learning about the, the past of dead people, which, thankfully, I've now changed my ways, but I have found that not being interested in learning from history has generally not worked out very well. <laughs> um, Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to are doomed repeat, to repeat it. it. Yep. So, so while I'm not interested particularly in learning the the uh, the aesthetics of people who came 200, 300 years ago, I'm getting better at it. But moving on from that. So just there wasn't anything in any of these classes that was like, I am ready to dedicate four extra years of my life to this in college and possibly an entire career. So voice acting came at a time when... I didn't have any interest in anything, and I was still paying attention to my classes. I wasn't, I mean, I was, I was slacking off, but I was still putting in the effort. Um, but it introduced something that just, just grabbed me at my heart. It, it, it just wrenched it out of me and went, look at this, look at you, what you could be a part of. Seeing a human being like me talking at the same time that a character's lip flaps were moving and being like, you can become a part of this world. And maybe, maybe that's what had what grabbed my interest so much was the idea of here I am in this world, not really being in touch with anything that's being put in front of me day after day after day after day, and now here comes this career that says if you get good at this, you can be anything. You can be <laughs> fighting dragons. You can be a vampire hunting other vampires. You know, you can have cool gravity powers. You can you can <laughs> have a, a lowly uh, a lowly girl with ribbon hair that. that <laughs> great magical prowess um and and it was one of those things where it's like you can do this if you're willing and me sitting there going <laughs> yes please <laughs> um so so that's what gained my initial interest but the moment there were two distinct moments that i knew there was the moment that i knew i wanted to do more of this and the moment that i knew i was capable of doing it to a degree that other people would want me to do it if that mm -hmm. makes sense um the first one that, that I knew I wanted more of this was I was helping out with a senior thesis project. Um, they were making their own game, uh, their own like 3D exploration. Think of like okay. Crash Bandicoot style game. Uh, in fact, I was voicing the little Tiki mess guide that, that was following them around. Um, and at the time, I was trying to do an impression of uh, the one guy from Futurama, the, the inspector or whatever his name is, Hermes. Hermes, Hermes. yeah. Um, it was a very bad Hermes impression. I'm <laughs> Um, 
but but to record they had me in this room that had its own makeshift booth it was these four sound absorption props creating like a little square and then in the center of the square was the microphone mm -hmm. so i'm standing in this little makeshift booth with a script in front of me uh uh looking at the the action on screen and and recording and the whole time my brain is going this is the coolest fucking thing i've ever done like I, okay. didn't, I did not want to leave that square. I was like, the moment I leave this square, I go back to the regular world, and I'm not prepared for that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's when I knew that it's something I wanted to, to continue doing going forward, something that I wanted to be involved with. The moment that I knew it was something I could do, where it wasn't just a selfish endeavor, <clears throat> was AX Idol 2009. Um, which I can actually, it's super easy to find that. Uh, 2009... AX Idol Finals Sean There we go Final performance It's introduced by Kyle A. Bear Who is a man that I respect immensely uh, Where is the chat for this There you go um, I went out there on a whim My family were on a ski trip In January of that year or It was like January or February and, and my dad had Or maybe it was later in the year I don't remember Maybe it was one of those towns That's like high up enough in the mountains That you can always ski there And I and I remember telling my dad, hey, um, now that I'm into this voiceover thing, there's something I really want to do. And and I, I'm i cool with this being my only birthday present. And he goes, what? And I was like, I want to participate in this. There's this convention called Anime Expo, and they have this competition called AX Idol. There's singing and there's voice acting. And I really want to do this competitively. I want to see how I fare up. I want to learn from other people. I want to explore. I just want to see how I do. And he goes, you're really sure about this? And I'm like, I'm absolutely sure. Like, I, I, I want to be a part of this anime convention. I want to experience, like, this craft that I want to be a part of. And I want to compete. And he goes, okay, I'll get you the... Uh, I'll want you to go have these on, like, the hotel cost. But I'll cover for your plane ticket. And uh, we'll get you out there. And um, when I originally went, it was to experience the convention and the competition. But after I made it through the auditions and got to and got picked for the final round, the convention just yeah. didn't exist in my head. <laughs> my my next thoughts, because because I believe it was the auditions were on day one and the finals were on day three. So mm -hmm. so auditions were towards the end of day one. All of day two, I just didn't exist. I was just in my own headspace, like trying to practice for the upcoming finals. Um, and then I, I went up. And I performed, and and I, I performed just the way that I wanted to. It, I wasn't even trying to do what I thought was right. I was just trying to match what I saw on screen and give it that intensity. Um, and you know, listening back to it, it definitely wasn't as good as it could be. But you could <laughs> tell that I was holding nothing back. You were putting all. your heart into it, and that's what matters. And so, and so, you know, the scene finishes playing. People start applauding, and then they keep applauding. And then they keep applauding, and it goes on for, I believe it was something like 22, 32 seconds straight. Oh, of wow. just of them Unprompted. I wasn't, like, goading them on saying, you know, clap for me. I'm just standing there. You're, you're in awe. <laughs> right. And, and, and if you watch the video, you'll even see Tony Oliver, who would later go on to direct me and stuff like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Golden mm -hmm. Wind, says, you know you're doing something right when you get a response like, like, I can't even say it without almost tearing up. It's that phrase when he says, you know you're doing something right when you get a response like that. Wow. And he points out to the crowd, and they start applauding again for wow. another 12 to 15 seconds. You can watch it happen in the video after this interview. And I'm just standing there just like I, I don't know what to do with myself because it was the first time that, that something that I was crazy passionate about was getting that same kind of response from the people that would be directly consuming it, you know? And there's a big, there's a huge, huge pressure. Um, you were getting the same energy as you were putting out. Like, it, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. I mean, it doesn't matter how much I'm enjoying it, but if other people that I'm supposed to perform for don't care for it, then, you know, there's yeah. a gap there. You know, there's, there's a shift there. So for me to bear my heart out there, and have people react that positively, that was the moment that I knew. That was the moment that I knew, okay, this isn't just a pipe dream. This isn't just a selfish endeavor. This is something that is meaningful to you that other people are willing to support. Don't lose that. 
Mm -hmm. And that that's when I knew that this was going to be something that I chased, hopefully, for my entire life. That's a strong and powerful answer there, too. And and there was a good story attached to it. Yeah, there, was there was. That like, answer went on for way longer than I thought. No, would, no, no. This is what no, we like. Perfect. This is what we like, Cause, man. Because we, we, <laughs> we, went, we went through time with you to when basically it changed your life. Mm -hmm. And that was a wonderful ride to be part of. I mean, plus... And, and to be able to, after the interview, to be able to go and watch the auditions, the AX Idol 09, like, that's going to be a continuation of that story, too. Yeah. So not I only will we be able to still, hear it, we'll I be able to see it. it. Hold on. Let me, let me Hold on. Pause. Oh! What's he doing? Anytime, anytime that I adjust my room setup and I move things around, I make sure that this is sitting somewhere. Ah! Oh, wow! Yes! Oh, that is awesome! Thanks for I mean, showing that. Well, I definitely gotta clean it. It's dusty as hell, but um, well, it was oh <laughs> nine. I just, I just use this as a reminder. Like, I mean, I've had more examples since then. Like Breath of the Wild, the callback. I had the option of doing the callback audition remotely because I was visiting my then girlfriend, now wife. Mm -hmm. um, so side, side, very brief side tangent. Um, back when we lived remotely or when we were long distance, I only got to see her like once, maybe twice a year, and it was almost always on my dime because she didn't have as much. In yeah. savings um so i was i was visiting her on my probably only visit of the year it was supposed to be for two weeks and one weekend they gave me the call back and and i had the option to record remotely but i decided you know what if it's worth doing it's worth doing in person you know mm -hmm. i i think i know what this is for i want to give myself every opportunity i want to show that i care about the project so i told my girlfriend and then or then girlfriend aj i was like i need to go home and do this like this is something really important to my career I love you, and I will make more time for you, but I, I, I just feel it. This is something where I need to make a choice. And she goes, jokingly, but she goes, you better book this or I'm going to break up with you. Like, <laughs> like, I've been waiting all year for this visit, and you're going to do this to me. You would better fucking book that job. I did. So. Uh, Spoiler so I alert. Other, I, I have other examples like that, but, but this was one of those first examples of me making a decision related to my career putting my entire heart and soul into that decision, committing to that choice, and having it pay off. Because Humble beginnings. This this victory was what got me on the radar of Bang Zoom, which was my only connection to the voiceover industry when I moved out to California three years later after I finished college, and got me started on workshops, on, on you know, side roles, eventually let me audition for, um, uh, what's it called, Sword Art Online, uh, mm -hmm. Where I got to voice Diabelle, which was a one-episode role, but it aired on Toonami. Yeah, like, yeah, kid, like that's a big thing. <laughs> this kid who grew up on Toonami got to hear his own mm -hmm. voice on Toonami. So I wonder sometimes, like, how much longer it might have taken me to develop that relationship if I hadn't been a part of this. Like, mm -hmm. sure, eventually I might have been able to to start taking workshop with Bang Zoom, you know, start working with them in a smaller capacity. But I wonder how much more time it would have taken if this hadn't happened. So, that's always my reminder that there will be points in my life and my career where I need to make choices. And uh, sometimes it's a matter of just being willing to put yourself in a really fucking scary situation. Yeah. And trust that as long as you follow directions and bring your passion, something cool will happen as a result. Because as long as you put your heart and soul into something, you know that you did the best you could. Right. I'm glad that you didn't say you'll find success. It's never a guarantee that putting your full heart and soul and passion is going to just make things work. Oh, no, that's life, unfortunately. It's just how it is. It, it's, we don't live in a fairy tale. We live... But it does help a lot, and when it does work out, it usually works out. Really like I said, from day one when I heard you voice act from on Newgrounds, mm -hmm. I knew, I, knew you, you, I, I had this, this feeling in my head that you were going to do something. Mm -hmm. you, get, you get my applaud, sir. You get my applaud for even that. Oh yeah, I just have one more question um, for for myself. Uh, if you had to pick a video game world to live in, which one would it be, and Ooh. why? It's it's Pokemon, man, for the pure reason of just having animal companions that understand me. It's yeah. it's not even as simple as oh, I like the Pokemon designs, or you know, I want to battle people and become a Pokemon master. It's just if the squirrel friend is any indication. Like I was just about to say that. I have, I've always been a huge, huge animal uh, enthusiast, and so just the ability, uh, any game that has animal battle buddies is pretty much going to be <laughs> a thing on my list. 
Um, okay. It, it just so happens that Pokemon was one of the best examples of it. But well, Pokemon's amazing it, too. It's it, just Digimon works. Give me Pokemon with a Battle Network aesthetic. I don't care. There you go. <laughs> So, okay. so you live in the Pokemon world just to be surround yourself with an, animals and, I, and creatures. I whether whether I was the uh, just someone who uses them as like we've started seeing a lot more fan art that's like Pokemon in daily life. Here's how people live alongside Pokemon that doesn't involve battling whatsoever. You know, sure I might be into battling at least until I see one of them get really badly hurt and yeah. Then, uh, right, like I've read the manga, I know what can actually happen. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but no, I, I know for a fact that it is something that my heart would swell at the opportunity of just, I don't know, you just daydream about fucking going to Alola and, and, you know, chilling and seeing like the, the Pekapex or whatever they are in the trees and just like having your companion Pokemon that you're going swimming with and stuff like that. I, it's, it's a no brainer. Who doesn't want yeah. a Pikachu as a friend? So yeah, that, that's a good one. I, uh, obviously you love Pokemon. Pokemon is your jam. Right. And that, that's, I couldn't that's tell because I, like, I can see the Arcanine up there, Pikachu yes. up behind you. <laughs> so, real quick, did you name your squirrel friend? Uh, no. I'm not going to name them unless they manage to trust me enough that I can actually make physical contact with them. Yeah. But, okay. Yeah, I don't I don't think that's going to happen. I think they're, they're too wild. They don't visit often enough. They trust enough that I'm a source of food, but I don't think they see me as a source of comfort. Or yeah, I mean, that makes okay. sense. Yeah. Okay. So let's start. We'll start the question. The questions for uh, that I got from fans and friends here. Uh, <laughs> first question is going to be from Sarah, and she asks, uh, "What was it like doing voice work for a show about the inner workings of the human body?" And of course, she's talking about cells at work. Oh, cells at work. Uh, I really like that I play the comedic relief white blood cell who also goes super acts crazy whenever anything actually threatens the body. Um, I thought it was really interesting. I, I found out that they actually do a lot of, they, they check with scientific research and with um, uh, relevant scientists to make sure that the information that they were uh, showing in the show is correct so that obviously they don't give like wrong medical information. Yeah. Um, I just, I always really enjoy shows like that that find interesting and unique ways to educate a population. Mm. Like I normally probably would not pay a lot of attention to inner workings of the body research projects. But if I can learn about how the body reacts to things through an anime, and it's scientifically accurate, hell yeah, let's go. Well, it's putting entertainment to medical stuff, and that's really cool, you know. Right. She has another question. I, I, I took at least two to three questions from these from from certain people, and okay, this one's a Genshin Impact question. Okay. After all that time in Genshin Impact, does Hilly Troll now seem like a normal word to you? I, I don't think I've said hillichurl enough uh, to make it seem like a normal word. That's probably something you want to ask somebody else. I do appreciate that D. Luke is like me and that he appreciates good grape juice more than he appreciates wine. Um, spark, sparkling grape juice is one of my... Like, I, I had years where I was invited to have wine with the adults at the, at the wine table, and I asked for sparkling uh, red grape juice instead. Um, however... The one that I feel like I got off scot free is not having to say what's the word? Heyue? Heyu? Heyue? Heyu? Heyue? 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 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, 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 everyone in the cast that I know of was talking about the pain of that word and wanting to get it on like t shirts. And I'm just over here like, <laughs> Monstat? <laughs> like, Monstat. Monstat. His name's Laser Kid. Huge fan. Uh, he he begged and pleaded to be on this podcast. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here because uh, I didn't uh. want too many people. But uh, it, some some of the questions that he asked were, how do you decide what voice to use for a character? I will usually so uh, it's a careful mix of what's fam and what's different. Uh, if you remember what I discussed earlier about Subrunatsky versus Shiki Granbell, perfect example of finding. Okay, well, what do they share in common? You know, they're protagonists, you know, they're they're brought to a different world that they're not sure how to process at first. Okay, well, it makes them different. Like, what about their personalities are different? Um, another good example is uh, Guido Mista in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Golden Wind. I'm trying to remember if he was the reference or if he was someone that I, uh, that I developed off of a reference. So maybe I need to come up. Oh, uh, another example is um, Teba in Breath of the Wild was based off of uh, Sheen in the Bedfellows animations that I was a part of. 
because Sheen was always very aggressive angry. He was always like, you know, there was kind of like this angry gravel to his voice, like he was about to lash out. Um, and so I said, well, what if I take that anger and I turn it into bitterness instead? What if the reason why Teba is always so upset or also always so stern isn't because he's pissed off, it's because he's worried. And that creates like a different effect in the throat. Mm-hmm. Like it's a lot more internalized. And so that's, that's how I will come up with something. It's a mix of what the director's looking for what the character honestly sounds like to me when I see their character image. I'm really big on having character ref images if possible. And then uh, what makes them similar and different to other characters that they remind me of that either I've played before or that I've recognized in other media. What's the most challenging role you've ever done? (sighs) The most challenging role I've ever done. Hmm. It's hard to come up with a specific answer for that because we can look at it in terms of intensity. We can look at it in terms of difficulty understanding the character, which would probably be Rivali. Yeah. We can look at it in terms of... It's a good question. Tell him, <laughs> tell him I said it's a good question. Making you um, think. The reason why it's hard for me to answer this is because I... I'm, I'm, there's been sessions that have been difficult, that have been challenging, but at the end of the day they just feel fun you know like it's it's hard for me to look back on anything and say oh that was really challenging because my brain almost immediately goes yeah but you did it like Mm -hmm. you pulled it off so what do you you did it and now it's going to be easier next time like what was so difficult about it you had fun fuck (laughs) i don't know i don't know how to answer that that's Uh, okay that is it is kind of a difficult question uh, any any role where I have to scream incredibly, like, I, I would say at some point, you know, Subaru was really difficult because I l- had to learn how to cry and how to scream and make it sound legit. But now I would say Shiki was more difficult than that because it was all the same stuff as Subaru, except the screaming happened more often <laughs> and it happened in a higher register. Yeah. Which is really difficult to do. In fact... I think the only thing going for me that's going to make it less difficult going forward is that I no longer have a chronic sinus infection. Um, (laughs) At the time that I recorded for Shiki in season one, I didn't know this yet because I didn't have a chance to meet up with a a proper ear, nose, and throat doctor, Uh but I apparently had this mild but persistent uh, sinus infection in the pockets of my cheeks that was causing mucus to constantly go down the back of my throat and irritate it. Um, it wasn't preventing me from performing, but when your throat's constantly, like, bumpy or, like, irritated and swollen, it's gonna ca- make it harder to do certain voices without yep. your voice cracking. Um, so the fact that most of that is now cleared up could make it easier for me to perform Shiki in the future. So that's not even something that was easier for me now because I got better at doing it. It's because I don't have my own fucking mucus interrupting me. <laughs> yeah. In your body yeah. isn't against you. I want to say some of the hardest roles I've had to do have been the very few occasions where I've done Western or prelay animation, Um, some of which I can't talk about because it hasn't released yet, just because, I don't know, you would think that it would be easier for someone like me to play uh, a a cartoony aspect, but it feels like a lot of prelay animation is going for a grounded, realistic, like, just look at stuff like, um, um, I'm trying to think. Example. Jellystone is still a little bit more cartoony. It's it's more cartoony than other shows of the same kind. Owl House, you know, stuff like that. They're really going for this kind of real people in cartoonish situations uh, aesthetic, and I seem to struggle really hard with that. So I don't know. Those those are the ones that I would consider the actual hardest in terms of things that I'm still struggling to pick up on and get better at. Okay. Um, but outside of that, I don't I don't know. I don't tend to think about the difficulty. I, I'm very grateful that my brain has gone gone into this routine of you got the role because you're good enough for it. So just have faith in yourself and 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 just have fun and see what happens. You know, you've got people that want to see you succeed. So Yep. Then I'll I'll put it I'll say it again. I'm glad to see you succeeding. Thank I, you. It's man, I've I'm behind you hundred percent. I've been behind you since I first heard your voice. You're fucking awesome, Sean. Uh oh. I'll go on with a... Which, which one did I ask you last? Okay, challenging roll. Okay, so Laser Kid also asked, what adjustments did you need to make when you went from an amateur to professional voice acting? Um, I don't think there were adjustments I needed to make. I think what's more important is that there are qualities and personality traits that help an amateur become a professional. Um, there's actually a panel that I host at conventions called uh, Hire Me, Please, 
and it uses each of the letters in Hire Me to, uh, to describe a type of personality trait that successful people in general have, not just pe uh, people who want to do well in voiceover. And I'm going to try and open it, see if I can open it real quick in PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, so the letters, the letters in Hire Me, I say, stand for helpful, independent, responsible, exemplary, malleable, empathic, or empathetic. And I, I describe those as like core traits that will help anyone find success. And then towards the towards the end of the panel, I, I also talk to the please, the PLS, um, and I say, okay, well, there's there's different qualities that that please will help you uh, do as well. And I think it's passionate, something. Oh yeah, it's passionate, legitimate, and sharing. And they're things that you don't necessarily need to have to be successful, but they help you maintain that success more easily. Mm -hmm. And so that my answer is, I don't think that there's adjustments that I had to make besides, you know, getting better at time management as I book more work, you know, understanding the limits of my vocal health uh, so that I don't overwork myself and, and damage myself. But in terms of uh, going from an amateur level to being a professional, I feel like what helps you become a professional is having those traits. So mm -hmm. it's not about making adjustments. It's about um, embodying those character traits ahead of time and maintaining them as you progress from an amateur to someone that's trusted with more important stuff. Okay. Okay. Very good answer. Another big fan of yours, her name is Fandomaniac. She about freaked out when I said she was, you were going to join us. Ten minutes before we started the podcast, she sent me a gift that said she's jealous. Uh, her, her question is, have you ever read fan fiction of a character that you voice? I can't honestly say that I have. No. Um, I'm not opposed to it. I would totally do it for a panel if I had to, although if it was Rivali, I would not be doing it in the character voice. Um, well, that's just for con uh, contextual yes. obligation yeah. reasons. Nintendo. Um, it's, Nintendo. It's, not a, it's not a lack of interest, it's just a lack of time. Like, right after this interview, I'm going to be doing uh, freelance audio that's been overdue for like a day, Oof. and then I'm probably going to want to start on another playthrough of Deltarune Chapter 2, uh, because I want to properly do everything that I missed out on the first time. Yeah. And then I'm going to be streaming at 5 p.m., and then after that I'm going to be vocal resting um, and preparing for tomorrow. So I just, my day is so full most of the time that unless it's a personal interest or an obligation that I have to work on, it's just, there's no there's no space. Okay, that and makes sense. And you also killed one of the other questions because the next one was, uh, was it going to, she was asking if you did it, was it out of dare or because you wanted or you or you were curious. So that I, doesn't like I'm literally preparing right right now. Oh, that's another thing that I have to make time for. I am literally making time right now to um to to voice through or to to play through a game that features like transformation themes and stuff like that Ooh. and has some adult elements in it. The adult elements don't bother me, but it's it's something that they wanted to collab stream with me on and have me like live dub and stuff like that. Okay. So I've been involved with stuff that ranges the whole or or crosses the whole range from completely safe for all families to geared towards adult audiences whatever doesn't bother me yeah it's it, it really my choices are based on will i get in trouble for doing something like this <laughs> like is it is it uh is it demeaning to people is it yeah. insulting is it racist is it sexist if it's not then i don't fucking care what your opinion is it's yeah. a, it's a it's a creation it's someone's art mm -hmm. whatever two more questions left and these these are from sunrise uh, and his first question is, do they fly you out to do voice work at a studio, or do you have your own setup at home to do things online? Uh, they, they're only once have I been flown out to a studio to record, and that was when they specifically wanted everyone on the same setup for Freedom Planet 2. Okay. Um, out, outside of that, the pandemic obviously did change a bunch of things, but most of my work is still done from home. I do offer the ability to come in studio, one, because I know that some clients prefer it, and if it means that I get more work, awesome. Two, because there's a bomb-ass salad plate place right near most of those <laughs> studios that I get to treat myself to whenever I'm done working there. Um, and uh, but, but when I get the chance to work from home, it's great, and I enjoy the extra free time that it gives me. Um, I actually tweeted a thread about this, like, literally yesterday, about how I fully expect in-studio requests to come back but I hope that they come back as an auxiliary option rather than a mandatory standard. Um, because I feel like the explosion of record from home or remote recording has opened up the doors of opportunity in the industry in a way that wasn't given serious attention oh, even yeah. as little as five years ago. And mm -hmm. I don't want that to just simply go away. Uh, and the final question is actually kind of 
a different version of a question you already answered was uh, what was the most fun but most challenging voice work you've done? The most fun but also the most challenging voice work that I've done? Mm-hmm. So, so in the same in the same performance, kind of. Did yeah. I, uh, say the same thing as I said before about like it when it's fun. I don't think about the challenge of it. Yeah. yeah. No, no. I, I think I can come up with one that's fun and challenging. Um, okay. So recently, I got to announce how I voiced Purple Yam Cookie in Cookie Run Kingdom. And <laughs> I really enjoy- yeah, you already know. Yeah, so, I, I've seen that uh, ad a few times on. I do Twitch. really, I do really well with playing like very aggressive, very loud characters. But when you voice a character who never talks below a 9.5 on the aggression scale and the volume <laughs> scale. Oh my god, does it wear me down <laughs> super quickly. Um, and and that's definitely one that, that qualifies as both fun and challenging because there's another character that's challenging, but I wouldn't say they're as much fun because I don't know why they had me voice that character because they're like gravelly in a way that definitely is not close to my normal voice yeah um and they're even they have a little bit of an accent so like now i'm trying to play like this gruffer older accented character and 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 who also tends to be very jovial and very loud and i'm like guys please i'm not that voice type i'm a tenor <laughs> please stop so definitely i would say purple yam cookie is is the case where um he's fun i love him but I really hate them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and wind this down. Uh, Sean, is there anything you want to talk about as far as, like, advertise? Well, the sad thing, unfortunately, is that there's not much I can push that isn't already out. And if it's out, then I've already pushed it just because yeah. of how passionate I am about this sort of thing. Um, God, I don't know. Like, we've, we've covered a lot of topics, and, and while I don't do streaming as, like, a major thing, and pa- the pandemic's starting to... S- Kind of sorta. It's kind of, kind of sorta. You yeah. know, people have the option to get vaccinated. They have the chance to return to somewhat normal social life mm-hmm. at this point. Um, I don't know. Consider checking out the Discord. Um, my it's discord.gg slash hasn h a s n. Um, but the, I, I I don't even want to pitch it as like check out my stream, support my stream work because. I just do streaming for funsies. I don't do it as a source of income, and so I don't want people to feel like, oh, that's the best way to support Sean. Honestly, honestly, if, if there's anything that I could push, it's now that we have a chance to get vaccinated, if you know of a convention that is is requiring vaccination in order to attend, um, consider pitching me to them to be invited as a guest, because with how, at this, this will sound like a little, you know, kick the shaggy dog story, but, um, <laughs> with how busy I tend to be, I don't really get a lot of time to myself. There there have been plenty of days in the last year where my free time, and I mean I can just do whatever I want without having something sitting in the back of my head, where my free time starts at like 10.30 in the evening. Um, oh. and, and, you know, a lot of people see conventions uh, or attending conventions as a guest as work, but to me, they're some of the only vacations that I get to willingly take because any other vacation that I take, I'm missing out on work. You know, I'm not being paid. I'm not earning anything for it. It's a it's a personal sacrifice that I have to make. I legitimately enjoy going to conventions because it gives me a chance to interact with people face to face, which is a lot more meaningful to me than just over like like they have stuff like uh, there's those apps that let you like record shout out videos to fans mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And I understand that they're important to some people, but I always feel really weird doing them because I don't know those people. I don't. Um, And so I'd rather get to know them face to face. I'd rather interact with them face to face. And also, it's my chance to get some really good grub in a place that's not my hometown. Because I already know where all the good grub is around here. I want to have like, you know, Nashville BBQ. (laughs) I want to have like good seafood on the on the east coast yes um uh all right well i guess we'll wind this down uh, again sean thanks for being here i know you, you, yeah. you've been saying you've been a busy man i appreciate the time I you appreci- can blame you can blame world flipper for that and i'm glad <laughs> that i was able thankfully thankfully i'm at a, a level where i can just let it run by itself and then answer these questions <laughs> if i were having a, i probably would have gotten in major trouble for just being like uh yeah it's uh uh it's uh hold on uh so <laughs> <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and end the podcast here, guys. We want to thank you guys for watching and listening. Uh, definitely, he didn't. He said he wasn't going to drop it, but I'm going to go to his go to Sean's Twitch 
Yep, it's the same as my Twitter, twitch.tv slash Sonic Mega. And I check it out. Or, I try to stream uh, Thursdays through, or Fridays through Tuesdays. Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, no, Friday through Tuesday. Um, and we've got an amazing lineup of games right now between Fuga, Shadowverse, Metopia. Um, I plan on adding the dungeon crawlers when those come out. And, and as you might imagine, I like to voice act the characters as I'm playing them as well. So if you'd like to hear more of my range, if you want to see what I, I do for practice, drop on by. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in. Till then. Stay nerdy. Stay sexy. Always.